Begin now with one of the central motifs of all of the four quartets. The attempt to try to find a balance, harmony, between the movement that we call our life and the quest for stillness or peace or calm that we will hope for at the still point of the turning world. And we have to say this out loud and, and of course, uh, making sure that Whitman gets his say. You'll remember in uh, passage 48 of Song of Myself that he says that there is no object so soft, but it makes a hub for the wheeled universe. We're playing the same game here, right? This is, of course, the quest. It's Plato's quest. It's St. It's Augustine's quest as well. Go back to my comments on Harvard Classics from Confessions. It's the quest of finding some fixity, will be his term, some Still point. Some place to say, well, at least I've got this, right, in the middle of all of the motion. Think about that thing that you went to at the park when you were a kid, and you spin it, and some big, strong adult can kind of spin that thing, and you guys are on that thing, right? We talked about that when we talked about Yates's gyre, right? Of course, the thing is moving, but there has to be something that holds up that spinning kind of whatever it is that you've got, right, that fixed point. That's the quest, right? Remember Archimedes, give me a place to stand, he said, and I will move the earth. That still point of the turning world. Well, notice we have a bunch of neither nor attempts to try to say exactly what it is. Not this, not that is often the rendering in the Hindu or the Buddhist language. Here, we're going to have already the introduction of some mystical language. What is this still point? of the turning world. I'll go ahead and give away um, um, the, the end of all of this. It's going to be love, and we'll get there later, okay? The still point of the turning world. What is it? Neither flesh nor fleshless, neither from nor towards. At the still point, there the dance is. But neither arrest nor move. Uh, we immediately think of what Mozart said about his music. Remember what he said? He said, the, the music is not in the notes. The music is in the space between the notes. Which is a really fascinating thing to say. But here I think we have Eliot trying to play at the same game. And do not call it fixity, line 66, 67, where past and future are gathered. Neither movement from nor towards, neither ascent nor decline, except for the point, the still point, there would be no dance. There is only the dance. Now, of course, this dance here makes us think about the idea of the dance of Layla, the, the idea that life is like a big dance, right? Of course, this still point is, another word for that, would be the present moment. And yet this present moment also, we never seem to, you can't capture it, right? You might experience it for a second, and then bam, it's gone. And now it's in the past. And then the next moment, coming, right? He says um, um, th that he says there is only the dance. This is all that there is, right? Um, of course, we could talk about the dance as maybe maybe hope, right, for us in, as humans, right? Um, the stars, uh, of, of course, are, are are going to come back here as we think about this, right? Right. The still point it exists beyond opposites. The dance is, of course, a symbol where maybe boundaries are blurred between the dancer and the dance. Okay. We should also say for your notes that the still point is, let's say it now, we're going to come back to this a lot because of Eliot's reading of Christian mystics um, and Buddhist and Hindu mystics as well, um, that it is translinguistic. You can't really talk about it. Real, uh, our study of Lao Tzu's the Tao, the Qing, real member, uh, opening lines, the Tao that can be spoken is not the true Tao. The Tao that can be named is not the true Tao. Um, um, the idea is that um, we, Christian contemplatives will say the same thing, that when one starts to try to define God or love, one is left without language, right? Without language. All right, let's continue. At line 70 through line 75, he says, I can only say, there we have been. But I cannot say where, and I cannot say how long, for that is the place it is in time. The inner freedom, and this is again the goal, so you'll want to write that phrase down. Inner freedom. Of course, outer freedom, well, you were born with the DNA. That is to say, there are certain parts of your life you'll never be free. I mean, you can't change the color of your eyes. I mean, unless you want to do some kind of contacts or whatever, right? You can't change a lot of the things that are you. 
And yet there is a quest for an inner freedom from the practical desire, the release. This will sound very much like um, uh, contemplative language. The release from action and suffering. I mean, what is the opening, right, of 4A, for Gudama Buddha and his teaching, life is suffering. Release from the inner and the outer compulsion, yet surrounded by a grace of sense, the beautiful Christian uh, poetry here, a grace of sense, a white light. Go through this poem all, the, all through the four quartets and pay attention to the ways that he uses light, very similar to the way Dante will use light, especially in his, well, in all, all three parts of, of, of his Divine Comedy, but especially in that last part, right, in uh, Paradiso. A white light still and moving. And then he uses the German word erbum, which means elevation, elevation without motion, concentration without elimination. This takes us back to the final lines of the hollow man between uh, the um, uh, between the shadow and the act uh, falls the shadow between the uh, you know on a, he makes those different comparisons those paradoxes right without elimination both a new world and the old made explicit understood we're back to the quest for perspicacity insight meaning in the completion of its partial ecstasy, the resolution of its partial horror between um, and, uh, that notion of between ecstasy and horror. We think of Conrad's Heart of Darkness and Kurtz's final words, the horror, uh, the horror, right? Um, yet the enchainment of past and future woven in the weakness of the changing body. In other words, we live in a body that is constantly changing. The body you now have is clearly not the body you had in fifth grade. Go back and look at the pictures of yourself, right? Okay. We're obviously talking here about some sense of a rising, that elevation, that German word erbum, um, that notion of rising, but without motion, concentration, the attempt to try and conquer monkey mind, right? Um, um, the, the, the idea of everything at once and yet without any kind of elimination. Spiritual peace, in other words, has to somehow come on the other side of the horror, right? as he suggested here. Uh, continuing at line 81, the enchantment of past and future woven in the weakness of the changing body protects mankind from heaven and damnation, which flesh cannot endure. We're back to that um, human, humankind cannot bear very much uh, reality. Um, it's hard to endure in other words, the fact that we live a life where at the very end of it, as we have said often in 303, at the very end of our life, all of us say the same words. The words are, oh my God. The only question is the inflection of our voice. Think about your Scrooge story, right? As we've said before. Think about your Scrooge story from, um, from Dickens' Christmas Carol. I mean, the first ghost comes and shows him the past. You know, he's like, yeah, whatever. It's not that big of a deal to him. He's upset, but okay. The second ghost comes and shows him the present, and he's a little bit more upset. It's that third ghost, remember, who comes dressed all in black, doesn't say anything, and just shows him the tombstone. At the moment, he points at the tombstone, right? It's at that moment that Scrooge is ready to say, just give me one more day. Why? Because most of us live our lives in such a way that we come to the final moment, and we go, oh, my God, what have I done with my life? It will be the hallmark of wisdom and we said this on our study of Plato, and wisdom literature, that you will be challenged to ask about your passing and your death before it happens, so that somehow you can live your life in an informed way. Lines 85 to 92, then we'll finish this second part. Time past and time future allow but a little consciousness. We're so busy living in either the past or the future. I mean, think about those lines from Longfellow's Psalm of Life. Trust no future, however pleasant. Let the dead past bury its dead. Act, act in the living present heart within a God or head. That idea that we have so little time that we give to actually this, right? Because we're so worried about that past future. Allow but a little consciousness. To be conscious is not to be in time, right? That notion of mindfulness as it sometimes is referred to in the wisdom contemplative literature, right, is somehow outside of time. But only in time can the moment in the rose garden, the moment, notice the repetition of the word moment here, in the arbor where the rain be, the moment in the drafty church, we're going to get to those churches later when we talk, for example, about little getting in that final, in that final uh, section, um, in the drafty church at Smokefall 
B, remember, it's fascinating to think that I'm the adult pushing my child at the park. While I'm doing it, I'm acutely aware of having all kinds of thoughts about how this happened to me when I was a child and somebody pushed me, how I'm pushing my child and someday my child will no longer be even a child to sit in a swing but will grow up. I'm having all of these reflections while I'm pushing my child. But my child is swinging in the swing and is fully engaged in that moment, or so I assume, right? The difference between being a child and being an adult, in other words, we remember past moments, and that's how we live those moments, right? Um, whether they be where the you know in the rose garden, we're back to the rose garden again, or the or the drafty church or whatever. And then he says it only through time is time conquered, right? Now, of course, we're we're heading back here um, to lines 45 and, and and so on when we're when we're in lines um, uh, 85 to 92, um, 85 to 86. Um, the idea is we seem, because of our bodies, we seem to kind of be stuck in time and it's very difficult for us to get out, right? Uh, although it is beautiful and wonderful to remember, all right, all those old memories, the challenge here is to enjoy actually the time that you have. Uh, now here again, we're drawing on the Christian mystical and contemplative tradition. Notice he uses the word conquered. Only through time is time, uh, only through time, time is conquered. War language, we're back to the opening of part two where he's talking about how the idea of war and conflict is ingrained in us. Of course in our cultural psyche as well, as we've said when we were talking about our lectures on Homer's Iliad, Homer's Odyssey, Beowulf, why is it so many of our great texts are war texts? Well they're about struggle because we think of life as kind of struggle and fighting. You'll remember that we said in our introductory lecture that T.S. Eliot will say in this four, in four quartets, he will talk about how he is stuck between two wars, and that idea of being stuck between Scylla and Charybdis, or between different kinds of struggles, remember political, literary struggles, spiritual struggles, all of those are subsumed in this word conquered as well. Let's jump really quickly now to 2A. Um, the challenge here, of course, is to conquer monkey mind and thereby gain freedom and thereby uh, uh, um, gain some kind of joy. We're going to hear more about this as we go. At 2B, the symbol, of course, here for us is the still point of the turning world, that hub of the wheeled universe, as Whitman talked about it. Uh, and 3A, well, there's lots of texts that come to mind. I just mentioned Scrooge as a classic example of an individual who figures it out. He does finally figure it out, and Dickens tells us that once he came to the moment of his death and he actually saw his tombstone, he was ready, he was ready for spiritual renewal, right? And that's why we love that story, don't we? Especially Notice when Christmas comes, at the end of a year, at the beginning of a, of a new year, right? Um, and finally in 3B, well, this is an interesting question about conquering monkey mind and why is it so hard? And maybe this question, what for you is the memory that you most love from high school and why? Okay, let's turn now to uh, um, section three, movement three. This one is lines 93 through 129. How well did you do? In, in the second reading with Conquering Monkey Mind and being focused. Let's try it again. Let's sit up and try and see just how well we can figure this one out. By the way, let's remind ourselves that Plato's pedagogy in Republic, remember in the cave allegory, always involves two things, fear and pain. Let's think a little bit about this notion of these are the, the, the always in all four of the four quartets. The third movement is the centering movement as some scholars have called it. We're gonna try and get some sense of what that centering is all about. Okay, let's go back to the reading now and see how well we do, all right? Follow along. Here is a place of disaffection, time before and time after, in a dim light. Neither daylight, investing form with lucid stillness, turning shadow into transient beauty, with slow rotation suggesting permanence, nor darkness to purify the soul emptying the sensual with deprivation, cleansing affection from the temporal. Neither plenitude nor vacancy, only a flicker over the strained, time-ridden faces, distracted from distraction by distraction, filled with fancies and empty of meaning, tumid apathy with no concentration, men and bits of paper whirled by the cold wind, that blows before and after time, 
wind in and out of unwholesome lungs, time before and time after, eruption of unhealthy souls into the faded air, the torpid driven on the wind that sweeps the gloomy hills of London, Hampstead and Clerkenwell, Camden and Putney, Highgate, Primrose and Ludgate. Not here, not here the darkness in this twittering world. Descend lower, descend only into the world of perpetual solitude. World not world, but that which is not world internal darkness, deprivation and destitution of all property, desiccation of the world of sense, evacuation of the world of fancy, inoperancy of the world of spirit. This is the one way, and the other is the same, not in movement, but abstention from movement, while the world moves in appetency on its metal ways of time past, and time future. Okay, now to read the third movement, there's a couple of things that we have to kind of set in our mind. Most importantly, let's go to our Dante. You'll remember that in Canto V, Second Circle of Hell, when Dante meets the lustful, they are blown by the wind, which is a beautiful word picture allegorically of what it is when we're just so caught up and, and, and we, need, we want something so badly um, and so badly that we forget about everything else. But this is not in a good way, this is in a bad way for Dante, right, okay? Now, we'll begin in part three with the opening here, as in uh, location, again, we're back to a place, a place of disaffection. The challenge, of course, for modern seekers is to try and find some sense of peace, time before and time after. Notice it's a dim light. You can't see very well. Go back to the Hollow Men and his referencing to Dante there as well. And then we've got the neither nor game being played again. Neither daylight, investing uh, form with lucid stillness, turning shadow into transient beauty. We think about the shadows on the wall of the cave allegory with slow rotation suggesting permanence, that's the neither, nor darkness to purify the soul, emptying the sensual with deprivation, what we'll call in contemplative studies the positive and the negative way, of cleansing affection from the temporal. This cleansing immediately makes us think about the words the word purgation, right? We even think about Aristotle's poetics and the idea that when we watch plays, there's a purgative uh, kind of experience, a cathartic experience. Notice we've got shadows from Republic 7 coming to mind. This notion of everything is transient, things that can't last. We miss them when they're gone. Spiritual deprivation will lead to a longing for peace. Uh, the problem, of course, is that we are stuck. Some have even argued the words here seem to suggest like numb. We are so caught up, right? And then we come back to this neither nor thing again. Neither plenitude nor vacancy. We think of the opening lines of the hollow men. We are the hollow men. We are the stuff men. How can you be both? Here, we're looking for plenitude, right? And then as well, vacancy. How can we, how can we do that? Only line 102 to 103, a flicker. It's almost like a, just a, a little bit of a, of a, um, uh, of a little bit of a flash of, of insight. Over the strained, time-ridden faces, talking about most of us as humans. And then line 104, some of us have said, this is the high school line of all high school lines or the college line of all college line. It may be the human line. Remember, Thoreau said, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. Here it's distracted from distraction by distraction. But the, I, for me, that's the most beautiful poetic line to, co to really comment on monkey mind. We're so distracted all the time that we n almost never have a chance, without maybe a little flicker, a chance to kind of ever take it in. I mean, I have seniors that will say at the end of the senior year, it happens so fast. I go, it what? The senior year, I said, what about your high school career? Well, come to think of it, that too. Well, what about your your school career starting in kindergarten? Well, come to think of it, that too. We live distracted from distractions by distractions. 
um, filled, to continue at line 105, with fancies and, and there it is, empty of meaning. Uh, we go back to, to my intro comments and we say, this was T.S. Eliot's quest. Where is the meaning? Remember, we had the experience but lost the meaning. Where, where's the meaning of it all? So much happening, distracted from distractions by distractions. Later at line 116, I'll even talk about a Twittering world. Now, obviously, this is long before, right? Elliot was living long before the age of Twitter or face filth or all the other things that distract us, constantly distract us, right? Filled with fancies and empty of meaning. Tumid apathy with no concentration. I've had students that say, he's just captured what it's like to be a student today living in this world of school. Tumid apathy. Uh, uh, school, yeah. Hey, what'd you do today, honey? How was school? Uh, it's an answer. Uh, no concentration. We don't seem to be able to focus. We can't ever seem to focus very long. Line 107. Um, we, um, uh, men and bits of paper whirled by the cold wind. Um, here, lots of ha have been, you know, symbolically um, the uh, the idea of maybe you know money, bits of paper. Poetic attempts. We can think about even that um, Sybil who you know writes uh, things and then it goes up into the wind, right? That blows before and after time. And then the line 109: uh, wind in and out of unwholesome lungs. Some have seen this as a reflection back to the wasteland. That is to say, if your experience uh, as a spiritual experience, uh, uh, your lungs are spiritually unhealthy, if you will, right? Time before and time after, right? Spiritual unhealthiness, right? The blackening, if you will, of our spiritual lungs. Um, and that leads to a spiritual